Let's take our Bibles this morning, and we're going to finish out the year, uh, I hope on a high note. I'm looking forward to 2014. 2013 has had its challenges, hasn't it? It's had its good times and it's had its rough times. For, for many of us that are sitting in church this morning, it's had, you know, those, those days we wondered what was going on, and then we've had those days that we could see the hand of God moving in so many ways. And so as we, we prepare ourselves to go into to 2014, I want to talk a little bit about you and Moses. I want to start over in Hebrews chapter 11. I want to look a little bit today at the life of Moses. Hebrews chapter 11, I want to read verses uh, 11 down through, I'm sorry, verse 23 down through 27 out of Hebrews chapter 11. I'll be reading out of the, out of the New King, King James. If ever there was a man that was called by God for a special mission in life, it was Moses. I mean, God, God handcrafted this man to do everything that he did. And it took some special preparation for Moses before he was launched into the, into the vision that God had for his life. When, uh, when Moses heard the call, when he talked to the burning bush... And he re was preparing himself and he was being prepared to head back to Egypt and bring freedom to all of the slaves, all of his countrymen. The truth is he didn't see himself like God saw him. The, the honest truth is he didn't see the world around him in the same light that God saw the world around him. And when God called him um, in, in Exodus, and we're not going to read in Exodus this morning, but there were actually two chapters, chapter 3 and chapter 4, when God is working on Moses and saying, Moses, here's what I want you to do. And for two chapters, there's this running dialogue between God and Moses. And Moses is telling God why he can't do what God said he can do. And every, every time that Moses came up with an excuse, God, God didn't even acknowledge the excuse. God just told him what he would accomplish and what he would do and how it was going to be. And really this morning when I, when I came to church and all week long it's, it's been on my heart to tell you that God's preparing you to use you and launch you in 2014 like never before. And what you're going to see in 2014, I, I, I don't want to say God's going to use you in 2014. What I want to say is God is going to work as you in 2014. And there's a huge difference between God using you and God being as you in 2014. And what you're going to begin to see in 2014 is, is really this effortless uh, merging of God's vision, your vision, and what He wants to do in your life. And it's going to become the desire of your life also to do what He wants to do. There's going to be no separation of will. Uh, I've, I've talked to enough people over the years to know that we've made this thing of God's will very elusive. And it seems like it's something we never are able to quite grasp. It's always just ahead of us. And some people spend 20, 25 years trying, trying to do the will of God. And God, God's going to make it easy for you this year. Whatever you put your hand to is going to be His will. And we're going to look at the life of Moses this morning and some of the things that happened to him and are going to be some of the same things that you're going to notice beginning to work in your life as we head into 2014. God is going to work as you in, in 2014. I want to prepare you for that. Just get ready for it. He's going to use you in times you don't even know He's using you. His will is not going to be elusive. It's going to be very easy to find because it's going to be whatever you want to do. He's working His will in you. It's God that works in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. His good pleasure will be worked out of you in 2014. Now watch, let's just read a few verses from, from this scripture and uh, we're going to pick out some things from verses uh, 23 down through verse 27 of Hebrews chapter 11. It says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. Verse 24, by faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. 
Verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Verse 27, by faith he forsook Egypt and fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now, I want you to get ready because God's, God, as we say in Texas, is fixing to send you back into Egypt to bring the slaves out. He's getting ready to send you back into Egypt to bring people out of bondage to the land that he's promised them. And as he prepares us for that, that's really why you've been going through so much change. <laughs> Am I the only person this morning that feels like their life has been going through a lot of change? You've been going through a lot of change right now. And, and sometimes you're wondering, what's going on in my life? Well, I'll tell you what's going on. He's stripping some things away so that he can replace what is stripped away with something new. He's, he's letting some things die in your life. Things are not like they used to be. He's letting some things die so that he can breathe on what is dead and bring his life to what he allowed to die. And what is dying maybe has been, as Pastor Dennis was hitting on a little bit this morning, your old ways or your, what you've been accustomed to always doing, the way that it's always been, he's letting that die. And once it dies, he'll breathe on it and resurrect it. And when it's resurrected, it's going to have, it's going to have the life of God on it and not your life anymore. Let me go, let me go beyond that. Let me tell you this morning, God is transforming you from doing something in your life to being something. There's a huge difference between doing and being. It, it's, 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 really, it's really moving you from being a good Christian to where you're not going to begin to walk as a son. He's transforming you from doing witnessing to being a witness. He's, he's moving you from, from giving somebody a track to being a living track. All right. he, he's moving you from doing a teaching to being the thing that you taught. That's, that's walking as a son from walking as a Christian. When we walked as a Christian, we would do witnessing. We would do handout tracks. We would do teaching. But now he's, he's moving things out of us and he's stripping things off and some stuff's dying and we're going through all this kind of transition because the walk is different now. It's not, we're not walking as Christians or believers as such anymore. We're walking as sons. And sons, sonship's a whole deeper, deeper level and a deeper walk. I laid awake one night this week, I don't know, for two or three hours and God just kept burning into me, burning into me. I'm no, I'm no longer calling you to do, I'm calling you to be, to be, to be, to be. So we're going to look at Moses this morning, perhaps the greatest, arguably maybe the greatest leader in the Old Testament. And for him to ultimately be what God wanted him to be so that he could do what God wanted him to do, he came through this little process. First of all, it cost him everything. It cost him everything. When he, when he moved into being and not doing, it cost him everything. And as he went through this, this process, he settled four basic issues. And as you're walking through a process in, in 2014, is, this is the last Sunday, 2013, and it's already been working in you, I know, I know that. It's, it's not going to just on New Year's Eve night, just all of this come. It's already been working in there, Right? So as you go through this process, I want you to be aware of it, and I want you to just submit to it. Don't fight the process. Let God process you. He knows exactly how to process you. Every one of us is on a different, little different program because we all have different uh, um, emotions and temperaments and all of that kind of thing. So God's got us all on a, on a little different program, but the ultimate end of the program is that we be so that we can do out of the be. The first thing that Moses had to establish, and God really began to work in his life, and what you're going to work in your life, and you've heard this word quite a bit over the last few months, is this. 
Moses had to, number one, he had to uh, define his identity. He had to define his identity. He, he was born a Hebrew slave, but he was raised uh, an Egyptian in Pharaoh's court. So there came a time that eventually he had to make a decision, you know, who am I? Am I a Hebrew slave or am I Egyptian royalty? There's, there's something that's creating an identity in your life this morning. I don't know who it is or what it is, but you do. There's something that is shaping you to, to make you see you as, as you see you today. Moses went through this thing, and, and it says in verse 24, if, if you read that verse again, it says, by, by faith Moses, when he became of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. There was this time when he became of age, when he matured. And you're, you've come to a place of, of some spiritual maturity in your life, and you had to begin now to figure out what's your identity. Now here's, here was the deal for Moses. If Moses chose royalty... If he would have chose to remain in Pharaoh's court, he would have had money, fame, luxury. Actually, he was the Pharaoh's grandson. Pharaoh's daughter raised him. He was actually in line for the throne. He would have had status. But if he decided, look, I'm really not an Egyptian royalty. I'm actually this Hebrew slave. Then he would have lived with the slaves in humility and he would have been doing hard labor. He had to come to a place when he said, you know what, I have to decide who I am. And maybe one of the reasons that God chose Moses is because God put, God wired Moses to be a man of integrity. He couldn't be something that he wasn't. And that's the dilemma maybe you're facing this morning. You can't be something you're not. He absolutely refused to live a lie. So in verse 24, it says when he came of age, that's the time when he grew up, he made a decision to be who God made him to be. Most of us that have come up in church, and we've been in church for years and years, we've been more concerned about what we're going to do than who we be. One of the major causes of stress in our life is trying, is trying, to, is trying to do what we aren't. We constantly are trying to do something we aren't. And so when Moses made a decision as to who he really was, it was so that he could do what he really was. Most of us are more concerned about what we do than who we be. And what God is doing today, he's doing this changing in us. And, he, and, he's, and he's working in us so that everything we do is going to emanate out of who we be. For example... In, in, Roman, in uh, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, it says, You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, can you see that the doing, the witnessing in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth come as a result of receiving power when the Holy Spirit has come on you? So the doing is arising out of the being. When you are anointed with the Holy Spirit with power, then you can do. Can you see how many times we've tried to do outside of the be? Now this is a very simple illustration that we are, are, can all relate to. But we've been, we've been caught up and we've had a lot of teaching about what we need to do, 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 do. And that's where we've concentrated on. And we can pressure and we can, we can manipulate and we can get people to do but the do doesn't last and it's not out of the heart because it's not who we are at that point. So when God is working in us, he's working the be in us. And when the be in us all of a sudden hits together, I'm going to tell you the do is going to be awesome. Right now I worry about the do. Because we have a lot to do. And we aren't at the point of be to where we're doing. And so some are still doing, even though it's not them. And God, and God is changing that. If you'll be what God made you to be, the stress level goes way down in life. If you'll just be what he wants you to be, and let the do come out of the be, the stress level goes down. And God, God has made all of us to be. 
And let me give you just a couple of quick scriptures. In, in, in Psalm 139, turn there with me. Psalm 139. I want you to read this out of your own Bible this morning. Psalm 139. And uh, let me just read, it, read a couple of verses. I want you to see some B. I don't want you to think any of us are outside of, of, this, of this B with God. Psalm 139. And let me read verses 15 through 17. This is David speaking. And he said, and he said My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. See, God was right there. God was right there forming you in a particular way even before you were anything. You see that? My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, skillfully wrought in the lowest part of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. Now that's a pretty phenomenal thing to see someone's substance when it's not yet formed. But what God is saying is there, I was working, I was working you to be a particular thing, to be something. And then he goes on and says, and in your book, they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. So this whole process that he's, that he's giving here, he's saying, look, you planned my life out. You made me a certain way. You put all the days of my life into your book, even though I had never lived any of them yet. The point I want you to see this morning is that God is strong on the B. And once he gets the B right, he knows the do will come. So God's, God's worked a whole lot more in us in these days because he's bringing out sonship. He's working to manifest sons. So he's got to work the be and the do will automatically come. And when we stress the do, 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 and we don't have the foundation of the be, we end up falling flat on our face, don't we? I've done a whole lot of do in my life that never worked out. I know it's because it was, I thought it was a good idea. Something I came up with. I mean, I am one resourceful dude. I can, I'm creative. I'm I can come up with plans faster than you can work them. But that doesn't mean that it's coming out of who we be or who, what we're supposed to do. Right? Then in Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, it, it, it says much the same thing. It says, for whom he foreknew, he predestined. What did he predestine? He predestined you to be conformed to the image of his son. Can you say amen? amen. So inside of us, the spirit is, is conforming that will enable you to be what God created you to be. Your talents, your gifts, your personality. And that's your, that becomes then part of your identity. And, and God's working that identity. And he's transforming you out of the identity that maybe your mama put on you. Or the identity your wife had for you. Or your friends. What they expect of you. And God has given you an identity of what he wants you to be. I want to give you one verse of scripture that I think really is strong on identity. Because essentially your identity is the same in the eyes of the Father is Jesus. That's how he sees you this morning. However you see yourself different from Jesus, that's a variance in the identity that the Father has for you. He was the firstborn among many brothers. So when we see Jesus, we see the identity that belongs to us. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1, and if you have an identity that is not, when you see you, if you don't see him, then you're looking at the wrong thing. He's creating you to be as he is in this present world. That's your identity. In Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1, it says this. If you then be raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is is sitting at the right hand of God. If you, if you were raised with Christ, there's, there's how you need to see you this morning. That's your identity. Now I want to read that out of the, out of the Mirror Bible because uh, Francois really 
pulls this thing together in, in the mirror Bible. It says in the, in the mirror, you are in fact raised together with Christ. Exclamation. Boom. That is a fact, Jack. You have been raised together with Christ. Now ponder with persuasion the consequence of your co-inclusion in him. Look up here. Now this is what builds identity into you. When you ponder the consequences of your co-inclusion with him. See, what God is doing, he's building, he's building the be in you, and the way he's doing that is by letting you know that you were co-included with Christ in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So your identity now is switching, switching from how you see you to how he sees you. How he sees you is your true identity. How I see me is a sum total of of my perception of how you see me or how my parents see me, how my friends see me, my failures, my successes, that has nothing to do with how God sees you. God sees you as co-included in Christ. You're in fact raised together with Christ. If you see yourself any other way, if you don't have that perspective, you're seeing wrong. Can I get an amen? Now ponder with persuasion the consequence of your co-inclusion with Him. Check this out. Relocate yourselves mentally. Relocate yourselves mentally. Moses had to relocate himself mentally. He was taken as a small baby and taken to Pharaoh's court and raised as Pharaoh's son. When he came back and discovered he is actually a Hebrew, do you know what? He had to relocate himself mentally. He had now to begin to think like a Hebrew. He had to see everything different than he had ever seen it. And what, 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 what your identity is involved with is you relocating yourself mentally and engaging your thoughts with throne room realities. His resurrection co-raised you to the same position of Authority where you are now co-seated in the executive authority of God's right hand. Now that is your identity this morning. So the first basic issue that Moses had to, had to resolve, and boy, I could just do, I could, on these four, I could do one a week. This is good stuff. Because this is life's transforming. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you something that will totally change your life. This is not just feel-good religion here. This is not just positive thinking. This is not just, you know, seeing life in a good light. This is the reality. I'm telling you the reality of who you actually are this morning and what your real position really encompasses. This is heavy-duty stuff right here. First basic issue you have to resolve, who am I? Who am I? You may have to spend some time alone with God and relocate yourself mentally. It's not an easy switch. It's not an easy switch. It's not an easy thing to see yourself. Can you back, back that up? Let me just read it through again real quick. It's not an easy switch. You're in fact raised together with Christ. Just, just to see yourself, you know, relocate mentally. Start seeing yourself looking down on things. Rather than being all involved in it, how about if we get a perspective, we're looking down from our seat in heavenly places with Christ. You start seeing circumstances, not as being overwhelmed by them, but now you're seeing, you're seeing them from a position of, of being above them and in control of them. Relocate yourselves mentally. Engage your thoughts with throne room realities. His resurrection co-raised you to the same position of authority where you are now co-seated in the executive authority of God's right hand. All right, so the first thing that Moses had to do, we read it in verse 27, is that he, when he became of age, he said, look, I got to be who I am. I want to challenge you this morning. In 2014, let's be who we really am. Let's be who we really am. All right, second thing that Moses came through in the second decision you're going to have, to have to come to is this. Number two, you, you have to accept your responsibility. Once you know your identity, once Moses knew what he had to do, then he had to accept the responsibility to do what he had to do. 
let me say it like this. If I'm going to be what God wants me to be in this life, then I have to stop making excuses why I can't be. Why I can't be. Now, when I say accept responsibility, Moses accepted responsibility. When I say you have to accept responsibility, here's what I mean. Your responsibility is this. <laughs> it's not to initiate. Your responsibility is to cooperate with Him. That's all your responsibility is. Your responsibility is to cooperate with Him. That, that is taking responsibility for your part. Your part is not to make it happen. Your part is not to initiate. Your part is to cooperate. As He shows you, leads you, guides you, unveils to you, reveals to you, you cooperate with it. So that means you're going, to have to, you're going to have to stop making excuses. You're going to have to stop saying, well, I can't be, you know, because of others. I, 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 I'm seeing myself, you know, I'm, this, I'm a victim of, of circumstances. I'm, I, I was doing some research the other day on something, and I ran across a fact that, that kind of blew my mind. I read that in America, and I read it on the Internet, so I'm sure it's true. I read that in America, check this out, there are now 3,000 identifiable different kinds of victims. 3,000. It seems like everybody's a victim of something. So when I was reading through the article, I began to see what a victim I am. I never felt bad like I was victim. I, I'm a victim. Of, a lot of you have victimized me. Everybody is a victim of something. You know what? Because life isn't fair, is it? Come on, let's just admit it this morning. We might as well. Life is not fair. We live in an imperfect world, so we start victimizing ourselves and blaming others why we can't be. And what God's doing, He's going to strip all that away until you just start cooperating with Him for what He's working out in your life. That's called taking responsibility. Moses had to take responsibility. And he did it in verse 24 and verse 25. If, you, if you're over in Colossians, turn back to, to Hebrews. I want you to see Moses taking some responsibility, some cooperation with what God was doing in his life. Let's look at this in verse 24 in verse 25 of Hebrews chapter 11. It says in verse 24, By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused... Underline refused. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing rather to, be, to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. So we see in verse 24 that Moses took some responsibility. He refused. He said, I'm not going to do this. That is not me. That is not what I do. And then it says in verse 25, he chose. So he did some refusing and he did some choosing. And it was, in, it was in response to the influence that God was exerting in his life to go back to Egypt and deliver the slaves. And part of this process was he had to accept responsibility to refuse and choose. It's a negative followed by a positive. Moses set a direction. He took responsibility. And Moses could have said, well, you know, I came from a dysfunctional family. My mama gave me away. My mama shoved me out in this basket out in a river where there were alligators. She had no clue what was going to happen to me. I can't tell you how abandoned I was when I was just a child. He was a victim. I was adopted. He could have had this whole mentality. He, I was right. This isn't my roots. This isn't my culture. I've been messed over all of my life. But you know what? The mark of emotional and spiritual maturity is when we stop blaming others for the problems that we're facing in life. Moses grew up and made a decision he was going to cooperate with God. I mean, if a burning bush talks to you, you probably cooperate too. He makes, and so he had to refuse and to choose. He cooperated. 
Were there bad things that happened to Moses that we would look at that were out of his control? Absolutely. But the Holy Spirit was given to you to lead you and guide you today and tomorrow so that you can set the direction that God has created you to be. And I, found, I found this little verse over in Philemon. How many people have read Philemon in the last 30 days? <laughs> it's tucked right over there, and, and you, don't have to, you don't have to turn there if you don't want to, but I, I, I found one little verse. I'd never seen this before. And I thought it was really good. It's, Philemon is tucked in between Titus and Hebrews. And it's, this, it's only one chapter, but it's verse 6. And this smacks really of responsibility. Here's your responsibility right here. Watch this. Uh, it says that the sharing of your faith may become effective. How? By the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. So how do you... How do you how do you do the effective sharing of your faith? How does that? It comes when you acknowledge every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Now that only comes by revelation. You only get to acknowledge every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus as the Holy Spirit shows you. So as the Holy Spirit shows you, you acknowledge it. That's your responsibility. That's all your responsibility is. When he shows you, acknowledge. And as he shows and you acknowledge, then the sharing of your faith becomes effective. So the responsibility that God has put on my life is to learn what my identity is, who I am in Christ, and, and who I am in Christ is Christ. As he is, so am I. That's my identity. And as I see that more and more and more and it's unveiled more clear and more clearly, then you know what? I know exactly where to cooperate and to take responsibility. I can cooperate when I see every good thing which I have in Christ Jesus. Then I cooperate with that. All right, now once you got an identity, here we go. Number one, once you got an identity. And number two, you accept responsibility you cooperate with what God's doing in your life, then of necessity, once you've got this identity and this cooperation, number three, you're going to have to set some priorities in your life. 2014 is going to be a year you need to set some priorities. Priorities mean, means this. I've got to settle some issues about what's really important to me. Some things that are really, what's important to me? And you may need, need to reevaluate if, if you haven't really thought about it. You've just kind of been living life, floating along. You know, you haven't really sat down and go, okay, look, I, this increased identity, man, I'm seeing more and more who I am. I'm understanding more and more what God created me to be. I'm cooperating with him. I'm taking that responsibility. I'm, I'm, I'm acknowledging these things that I see that I have in Christ Jesus. That's going to make me now have to make some priorities of what I will be, what I won't be, what I will do, what I won't do. And Moses did that uh, in verse 26. So back to Hebrews chapter 11, and let's look at verse 26. <clears throat> he did that. It says in, in verse 26, Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Underline that word esteeming. He esteemed, that means he made a value judgment. I didn't read it in other translations, but I know what esteeming means. It means to make a value judgment. It means to consider, uh, weigh in the balance. He esteemed. He sat down and he said, these are the values that I'm going to live by. That was a value judgment. In verse, in verse 26, when he says that he esteemed, he made a value judgment that the reproach of Christ was greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. That was a judgment call. That was a value call. That was a priority call. You have to make some priority calls. Now I want, I want to give you some homework this week. It's, it's New Year coming. Instead of making a resolution, please don't make a resolution. All you're doing is making a law. And Christ is the end of the law for everyone who believes. So don't tell me you're going to lose 15 pounds and then I see you in, in February and you've gained 15 pounds because you made a law and as soon as you make the law, you're going to break it. It has the, 
The, the strength of sin is the law, right? But rather than making a resolution, I want you to sit down and I want you to, to, to make a list of values. I want you to say, these are the things that I want to build my life around. You're recognizing identity. You're cooperating, taking responsibility. It's going to bring you now to where Moses was, where you have to make some value judgments. If you don't do this, you're going to live like you have been, and others will do it for you. Others will decide how you spend your time. Others will spend, decide how you spend your money. Others will decide how you spend your energy. You must determine some priorities. Moses did. He esteemed. He esteemed. Let's read it again. Verse, esteeming the reproach of Christ, a value judgment. Greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked to the reward. You've got to determine priorities. Now, the world... The world has a value system. And we see it in verse 24, 5, and 6. Let, let me just point it out real quick. Verse 24. Here's, here's the world's value system. By faith, verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. By refusing to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, he was rejecting the value of power and prestige. Can you see that? That's, the world has a value on power and prestige. I would have, a lot of people looked at Moses and said, Moses, you need to have your head examined, buddy. You got it made. You are, you are in line. Do you understand what you're passing up here? God did, a, God did a masterful thing at setting you in this place. See, he had to make a value judgment. Then in verse 25, it says, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the, the passing pleasures of sin. There's a second value that the world has. It's pleasure. It's pleasure. What, if it feels good, pleasure. So we see power and prestige, verse 24, is a value the world has. <clears throat> the world has a value of pleasure. And then in verse 26, it says, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Man, those treasures in Egypt are possessions. Those treasures in Egypt, he, he had to make a value, determination, a priority that power, prestige, pleasure, and possessions were not what he was after. And in, and in its place, in verse 24, he's really saying that God's purpose is more valuable than the power and the prestige. And he's saying in verse 25, God's people are more, are more valuable than the pleasures. And in verse 26, he's actually saying God's peace is more valuable than, than the treasures or the possessions. So we look at the world, world has a value system that Moses pushed aside. He made some, he made some priorities he pushed aside the power, the prestige, the pleasure, and the possessions, and he embraced God's purpose, God's people, and God's peace. And I hope when you sit down this week before New Year's and you make some priorities, I hope that you make some priorities that revolve around God's purpose, God's people, and God's peace. See, your values are determined by your vision. Where, where, where God is taking you, what you see, they're determined by vision. You get your eyes on the right things, your values will be right. All right? So three things so far Moses had to do. You, you're going to have to do two. Because God, is, is, God is, is creating you to be, no longer to do. He's bringing you into sonship, not just being a Christian. Whole lot deeper walk. Whole lot, whole lot stronger. Involves identity responsibility or cooperation with what God's doing, it involves making some, some priority calls in your life. All right, then what sews all three of these together and what really brings the cement is what I see in verse 27. In verse 27. He made the fourth choice in 27. It says, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. 
Now let me just read, look at this again. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was invisible. Here's the fourth thing Moses had to do. He had to choose who was going to be the authority of his life. He did not fear the king, verse 27, but he endured as seeing him who is invisible. So Moses had to make a determination. Is the king or he who is invisible, which one is going to be the authority in my life? Now you're going to have to make a choice. Look at me this morning. You're going to have to make a choice as to who is the authority of your life. Now you got two choices. You or God? There's only two choices. Ultimately, they're going to be the authority of your life. You or God? And you will pick the one that you believe is sovereign. You will pick the one that you feel calls the shots. Now I want to suggest, humble suggestion. There's only one sovereign will in the universe, and it's not yours. However, if you believe what some call that free will is sovereign, then that's what you will follow. If you think that you can ultimately make the supreme choices for your life, then you will follow what you deem to be the best and the right and the good. However, when you do that, let me just tell you something. You're always going to be questioning and second-guessing yourself. Did I make the right choice? Did I make the right decision? Did I make the right call? If you deem that your, your will is the sovereign will and that you really are the master of your ship and the master of your fate, then the pressure will always be on you to produce because you're trusting you. And when you trust you, See, I know a lot of you, and, 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 and you second-guess yourself. You question, man, if only I, if I would have just, ah, I made the wrong choice, I made the wrong call. If only I would have done this, if only I would have gone there, taken that job, been, done this, been there, done, you know, all that kind of stuff. And you know why, you know why that pressure's on you? Because you think you are the one that's in charge of you. That's the way we've been raised in church. You're in charge of you. So in essence, what you're saying is, I am the sovereign will of my life. Now, if you believe that the will of an omnipotent, omniscient creator is sovereign, which I would advise you to do, if you believe that will is sovereign, then this morning you can relax. You can relax and you can rest knowing that it's his problem to make all things work together for the good in your life. If you will make a decision that His will is the sovereign will and your free will is not the sovereign will, then you can have peace that passes the soulish understanding knowing that the one that started the good work has now the pressure on Him to complete the good work. If you this morning will say his will is the sovereign will, you can rest knowing that when we make plans, we do, but he is the one that directs our steps, right? So you either are going to be in charge of your life or he's going to be in charge of your life. If he's in charge, if you're in charge of your life, you'll constantly be in uncertainty, second guessing yourself, feeling you haven't arrived, you haven't attained, you didn't do the best. Because the pressure is on you to produce. However, if you will say, I am totally under his jurisdiction. My life's in his hands. He can direct it any way that he wants to. Then all of a sudden, the pressure is off of you and it's on him so that he can now do what he needs to do to make you be what you should be so that you can ultimately do what he called you to do. Now, with your own free will, you have tried to make yourself do what you think you should be doing. And oftentimes we have done what we shouldn't be doing because we jumped the gun and we weren't a bee, but we tried to do because it seemed like the right thing at the time. 
I'll tell you what Moses did. Moses made this, made this decision in verse 27 that he wasn't fearing the wrath of the king. Instead, he said, I'm, just, I'm under the total jurisdiction now of this, of this him who is invisible. Moses made a decision that the authority over his life was, was this invisible one that could bring to a successful conclusion everything he started. Now, some of you have not come to that place yet in your life where you actually believe that God can bring to a successful conclusion everything that he started. You have thought man could follow up. How foolish. Man can follow up what an omniscient, omnipotent God started and called from the beginning the way it would end. Somehow we thought we could mess the plan up. Now, I know when you go through all the things we go through in life, we question. And we say, God, do you, do you really know what you're doing here? I'm still down here. Did you forgive me? But I'll tell you what, every time that I've done that, I've done that sometimes in my life. Every time that I've done it and I get out far enough past it and I look back, I can see exactly how he orchestrated it. I can see exactly how he brought every step into being, how he used even my bad decisions, how he just said, oh, that's the move you made? Oh, then I'll move here. That's what you figure? Oh, I'll go here. And he had, as we read in Psalm, he had all the days of my life recorded before I ever lived one of them. He already programmed in all of my messes, my bad decisions, the responses that I would make that wouldn't be correct. And in his sovereignty, he programmed all of that in. He downloaded all of it. And what printed out was his perfection. Amen. Moses was born to take dominion over Egypt. He was born, he was crafted to lead God's people out of bondage. He never made it to the promised land because he messed up. But before he could ever do, he had to be. <sighs> folks, you're going to take people out of Egypt this year. There are so many folks that are in Egypt. They have a heart for God. They're slaving away, but man, they are, they are in such bondage. Now you can slice and dice your destiny any way you want but it's going to revolve around Genesis 126 where God said, I give man dominion over the earth, fish, everything. You can slice and dice your destiny any way you want, but it's going to revolve around that do of Genesis 126. But to get the do of Genesis 126 done, Jesus died so that you could be, so that you could be a bee. You could be as he is and fulfill all of the do of Genesis 126. But before you can do the Genesis 126, which we've heard about for years, that this is what God entrusted man, this is what God, that's all true. But we've tried to cut over there and do it on our own without the bee. We haven't got the identity down yet. We haven't got then the cooperation and the, and the value judgments in. We haven't recognized Him as the sovereign will of the universe. And when all of those things come together and you are being as He is, Jesus recognized that He could do nothing except His Father does it. He didn't, he didn't exercise His will. He said, there's one will that's working here. It's His will. Not my will, your will be done. All right. When all of that comes together, then we're being as He is in this present world. We're walking as sons. Then the dew of Genesis 126 just is a natural happening. Some of us need to nail these four things down, like Moses did before he ever approached Pharaoh. Have you defined your identity this morning? Have you taken responsibility? Are you cooperating with what He's doing in your life, or are you still kind of fighting it because you think you know better because your will is smarter? Have you determined your priorities and have you chosen the absolute authority over your life? If you haven't done that between now and New Year's, I hope you jotted those four down. Just sit down and think about it and let God do some directing. 2014 is going to be an off-the-chart year for many of you that are sitting here because the lights are starting to go on 
as to what God is really doing in the earth. Some of you are tired of doing the same thing you've done for 20 years and not getting the result you want. Isn't that what the definition of an insanity is? Doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over and expecting a different result. Some of you have walked down the same spiritual path for 20 years, done the same things, tried to make it all happen the same way, and you're not getting a different result. It's because that's not what God's doing. And some of you are catching it really quick. You're getting it quick, and there's a, there's a shift that's going on. The wave is rolling. And those that don't like it are just not going to get involved with it. But I'm telling you, if you really are embracing where God is taking you, then we got to know our identity. we got to cooperate. We need to make value calls in our life. And we need to recognize the supreme commander-in-chief of the universe is the one that will bring it all to pass and put it together for you. Amen? God bless you this morning. Let's stand up on our feet. Can we just give God a big praise the last Sunday of the year? Can we just give Him a clap and a shout and a praise this morning? Hallelujah! Lord, you are awesome in our eyes. God, you are good to us and we bless you this morning. Come on, Keith, just give him a shout. It's been 365 days of goodness in your life. Hallelujah. Bless you, Lord.